and welcome back to the Beards and Business Podcast. This is our second episode, and we have none other than Caleb Roberts with us today. My name is Anthony Pacheco, and I'll be your host. Caleb, a little background on him, is an experienced marketing specialist with the demonstrated his work in the marketing advertisement industry. Caleb is skilled in Facebook ad management, Google ads, film production, Adobe Creative Suite products, Caleb is also a strong marketing professional with ambition to bring in profit for every business. Caleb owns his own company called Select Pro Media, which is a video and photography company that has grown a team of talented photographers and videographers, editors, all dedicated to providing their clients with breakthrough imaging. Caleb also has embraced social media to its fullest extent and is currently the world's first TikTok-only ad agency. Welcome to the show, Caleb. Wow, wow, what an <laughs> intro. Glad to be here, man. Man, it's, uh, it's great to have you on. Hey, uh, just so that our, our, our viewers know a little bit about who you are and kind of where you come from, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little, little bit about where you're from, where you came from, those types of things. Yeah, so I'm from uh, around Dallas, Texas. If anyone knows where Denton is, that's where I was born. And I grew up around McKinney in a small town called Princeton. And uh, I grew up in small towns my whole life. So I obviously had to move around the country. So now I am in Las Vegas. And uh, yeah, I started my business. I started businesses uh, uh, in 2017 is when I first got into it full time. And I, I started a film production company before that. I was a full-time side hustler. I'd go dumpster diving and sell things that I found in dumpsters. I would refurbish old cameras like back there. I have a bunch of old cameras I would resell at flea markets and stuff like that. And then eventually I took a course and I learned how to start a production company and that became a pretty lucrative business. And then I moved on to marketing because more people kept on saying like, hey, you made the video, how do we market it? And I'm like, I don't know how to do that. So then I learned how to <laughs> market their videos. And then I uh, eventually got hired on as a marketing manager for, for a while, found an investor in my company, and then just recently bought out that investor and went all in on TikTok ads because of my experience within the last year with TikTok's platform. Wow. Yeah, that is, uh, that's quite the journey. So um, if you don't mind, we're going to take a little trip back to growing up in, uh, you said you're born in Denton, Texas, and being from Texas myself, uh, and actually living in McKinney uh, for quite a few years after I graduated, I lived in McKinney from 2001 until uh, 2004. 14 when I moved to Arizona. And so just the explosion of growth that happened there. Tell us a little bit about um, that area. You said Princeton, Texas. And um, so tell us a little bit about growing up in Princeton, Texas. What was it like? Yeah, so I I actually initially grew up in Denton to Allen, which is a nicer area around that area, and then went to Triton. And um, as you can tell, I'm where all the T's are just <laughs> completely ignored and um the, there in trenton is where i really got the small town vibes and it's still a small town it was so small and as you know texas loves football this this team had outlawed football because one person had died on the high school football team oh from like tackling someone and like tucking in their head the wrong way yeah. and it killed them instantly by breaking their neck so they outlawed it it was like wow. a footloose situation with football and what I think they eventually got a football team but it is a super super small town and it was it was all like country guys I remember next door there would be uh, our neighbors you know we were each on super big acre plots of land and um, they would sit out in their pasture and they'd shoot birds next they just sit out in their lawn chair and shoot birds and they taught me how to rope a calf with their little uh, hay bale and they put a little calf head on there. And that's where I learned, you know, I guess the real Texan uh, small town life. And then we eventually moved back for, to Allen and then to Princeton where I grew up as a teenager. And as a teenager, I actually saw them build out like everything. You know, when I lived there, there was only a Jack in the box. 
and maybe a Dairy Queen. And now there's, you know, there's, Texas, a, there's always Dairy Queen, right? Yeah, right. There's always a, it's always Dollar General and Dairy Queen that are in the small towns. And they're just like, we, we know that nobody has this and we're going to take advantage of being the only ones <laughs> with their expensive prices. So, you know, I used to walk back and forth from high school, just like an, a whole mile just to like get fast food and stuff. And, you know, it just grew. It, I mean, they just developers came in, just brought in thousands of houses, brought in a full size Walmart, not even a neighborhood market. And then there, wow. I can't even count how many fast food places there are now. Probably, probably around like 20 to 30 uh, different places, you know, Burger King, whatever. But it, and then I even saw them like I was there whenever their high school had just kind of been finished and they've like added on and added on now where it's like a, you know, they have their own indoor football field. I was there whenever they first finally got into the, the, uh, I guess state championships. Like they, they didn't get, they, I guess they went past their initial level and it took them around 30 years to finally get good enough to do that. But the first year they did, they flew in a football for the homecoming game with a helicopter and landed on the field. And then all of a sudden the next year we get a $3 million stadium. And so. <laughs> hey, that's Texas football for you. Yeah. Lots of money over there. Once you uh, finally get good at football and you start recruiting up people from other <laughs> cities and incentivizing their parents to move. Yeah, so, I, don't, I don't think you're supposed to talk about those things. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I saw, I saw the, small podunk town that I grew up in become like an actual place that people want to move to. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, completely changed. And I just out, I definitely outgrew it by, okay. by the internet, by way of the internet, finding out that there's way more out there in the world. But I initially, so I used to be a Mormon and I went on an LDS mission and I left for two years and that's where all that growth happened. And I lived in Europe. I lived okay. in the Netherlands and I, and I learned to speak Dutch and I also lived in Belgium uh, and in Brussels. So um, that's where I really got a taste for what the world was like outside of conservative Texas. And I really craved that again, once I came back to live with my family after two years, after learning a new language, meeting people from Ghana, Nigeria, France, Belgium, Germany, and and learning about their cultures, I really got hooked on that. So I had to, I, I still travel a lot and I, I still uh, like being in new places and kind of feeling like I'm learning something else in a different area. What's the, uh, what's your favorite place that you've traveled to recently? Uh, recently? Pre-COVID, obviously, you know, our favorite place you've ever traveled, that's fine. It, it would probably be Italy. I, yeah. In Italy, me and my wife, uh, we took a trip back to my mission area. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, wife. Where did, yeah. where did the wife come in? We, we haven't heard about her yet. You got to tell us about this. My wife, uh, uh, right after high school, I, I uh, started dating her and uh, she waited for me on my mission for two years. And then right after I got back, we got married like four months later. Wow. And then uh, two years later, we had our son. And so, well, we got a kid now. Man, did, look yes. at this. Yeah, I'm a, I and I'm uh, 25. So, okay, he's almost two years old, and um, his name is Rhett. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's that's the way. That's the way it should be. You should have uh, should have children when you're younger because you get to you get to grow in life with them, right? And yep. uh, they get to be there along the journey, and and uh, so that's amazing. Yeah, I've, sure. I've got four myself, so oh, I wow. completely, yeah, I completely understand the dad life and, and entrepreneur life. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, yeah, I think that's a, it's a pr pretty hard thing to do. No, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of parents that talk about, you know, it's either you risk business time for your family or you risk family time for business time. And one of them has a severe detriment, in my opinion, and I will always skip a meeting to spend more time with my family at the end of the day. Cause that's the, that's what I'd rather invest all my future into. Well, 25 years old entrepreneur, you've already nailed the most important part of life. And that is spend it with the people that are the closest to you. 
because as long as everything's going great with that, you know, the rest of the stuff, it's going to work its way out. There's going to always going to be another business meeting. There's always going to be another, you know, whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. But you get one, you get one to go with your kids. It's kind of how I look at it as well. And uh, my wife has always kind of made out my calendar uh, almost for the year. Here's all of our things that we're going to do. And then I schedule my business around that. Yep. And, um, you know, that's, that's really worked out well for us. And, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm trying to claw back that time. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way than dropping my son off in the morning times or, you know, being able to, you know, for a year, I think I picked up my kids every day from school and that was just a blessing. And, um, so keep enjoying that, keep going forward that I know your son junk. So that's, uh, that's some wisdom. So where did you get that wisdom from? Did you, did you just kind of come up on it on your own or is it something that's um, modeled or taught? I just think that's, uh, I didn't grow up with a dad really. Um, I, I grew up in a, in a pretty, pretty toxic family and I just, growing up without a dad, I just wanted to make sure I never gave my son a reason to not go through the same thing I did. Um, I didn't, my dad never left. I was more so ostracized from him and Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't his fault. So I, I just wanted to make sure it was never my fault either or that I never did enough. And I, you know, you always see those movies or you always hear those things. Like you hear some of the people on Shark Tank say like, yeah, well, you know, we needed money. So I, I I had to risk those years with my kids. And while that may have worked for them, or even Gary Vee, he talks about that too. I that's some that's a line I won't cross because that bleeds into your marriage and your relationship. And and going to therapy has taught me that too. It's it's just always been a part of who I am that I need to do that. And the most important thing that's ever been in my life is my family. And I can go bankrupt, but at the end of the day, I still have my son and my wife and I can rebuild a business. It takes years of therapy to rebuild a family and you may never get that back. I can, businesses come and go. You can, I, I've, I've owned several of them. I've built up several of them. I don't, I, it's not as permanent to me. Wow. 25 years old. There are some 30, 40s and 50 year olds that are going to be walloped with this wisdom, I promise you, spoken with true conviction, man, that is some, that is a true why behind what you do. And so um, it's awesome that you can be an expert uh, on the business professional marketing side of things uh, and be so grounded in your family and roots. And so that's, that's really fantastic. Um, so tell us a little bit about that business world of yours. Uh, tell us, tell us what's going on in uh, with, with your business and kind of where it started and how you grew into where you are today. Yeah, so what I started out doing was I, in the online course world, you know, whenever that started just completely taking over, uh, I think like five years ago, um, around 2017 is is when I started my business. And I bought, I used my wife's savings to buy, to buy a course. And I uh, was like, yeah, I know I can do it. I know I can I'll, I'll, we couldn't afford a, an engagement ring, uh, because that's what we we're going to use her savings for. And I had just gotten off my mission. I had no job, two years of no work experience. Doesn't look good on a resume, especially if you're right out of high school and there's like, what, what you disappeared, bro. So I couldn't get a job and I refused. I kind of refused to get one too, because I wanted to force myself to be a successful entrepreneur out of necessity. And so while I lived with my parents, I learned that course. And then by the time I got married within four months, it had become my full-time job and we could barely afford like a, I don't know, $500 a month apartment, studio apartment that was also in Princeton. And then eventually I, I built up that by, by going to networking events. I started doing paid ads on different service sites like uh, Thumbtack and wedding wire and the knot which are related to getting video jobs and um i started learning to invest back into my business and get loans to buy better equipment um but yeah i i've always built my business off of networking because that's that's one of the biggest strengths i have and i noticed that networking wasn't really being taken advantage of by people my age it's more of like an old guy 
you know, buddy, buddy, rotary club type deal. So I, I was taking advantage of that where, where there was no one really in that market. And um, then we had to move to uh, Idaho for my wife to finish up her degree. And I had to rebuild the business there. And I, the first week there, I just knocked business to business down Main Street asking if they needed any video jobs. And then I started marketing myself in Utah and, and continuing my business there along with Wyoming. And so it came down to sometimes I would fly back and forth between Texas for weddings. Uh, weddings became a main part of my business and uh, I was pretty good at doing them. I, I, I just noticed I was better at making wedding videos than I was corporate videos. And uh, then I started using that extra time during the week to learn marketing and uh, advertising and then buying more courses on Facebook ads and um, how people were being agencies. And um, I eventually, you know, I, I actually, on the weekends, they were all booked out all the time. So in the middle of the week, I would be a, a roofing salesman. So I'd just be like, well, let's, I mean, all of our money is now being made through weddings, traveling either to Texas or Utah, because no one in Idaho would afford me. And um, then I met my business partner who owned a roofing and contracting company. And I learned very intense sales tactics by going door to door, selling people on roofs. Um, and then I eventually got hired on as their marketing manager as I did my wedding video business on the side. And um, they, I mean, it was essentially a paid training. Like they, they're like, just take over social media, learn ads, here's a budget for you. And they paid me to learn. And we started doing lead ads and I learned more and more about how to do that. And um, I told them I couldn't work for them anymore while doing video because I was getting so many videos. So they're like, how about this? Let's invest in your company to start an ad agency. And so I did that and um, I wasn't good at doing the ad agency stuff because it was a whole new, the negotiating yeah. was way different, proposals were way different, client interactions were way different. It was a whole new game for me. And in the meantime, I was still doing videos and then all of a sudden the video production side just blew up for me because I was one of the only advertisers um, because we moved from Idaho to Arizona marketing for weddings in Arizona. So I started getting, huge market, right? Huge yeah, market I, in Arizona. It was a crazy big market. And I started networking with all the uh, venue owners and I built out my team and it was a very consistent, big business. And then COVID destroyed it in one swoop by making them, by making weddings illegal. So, mm. you know, I had my ad agency in the background. I was servicing one to two clients a month consistently but I was so busy scaling the wedding side. This was kind of off to the side. So COVID comes in, I'm like, well, I mean, <laughs> let's try this ad agency side now. And then I went on TikTok and then I, my first video got a hundred thousand views. And then I fell in love from there and uh, transitioned into a TikTok ad agency because now I work directly with TikTok and I talk with, you know, corporate executives or, their account managers and sometimes they help us with events, right? So I, I'm i fully, I drank the TikTok Kool-Aid and uh, I gave up my Facebook ad agency and transitioned it to a TikTok ad agency. And I'm trying to really be the pioneer in that space because it's a cheap medium right now. And I really understand it a lot better than most marketers. So I, sure. I'm trying to be that first guy that finds the case studies that finds new ways of advertising now. What do they say? All the attention, right, is there. And so, yeah. <clears throat> and it's not just young kids anymore. Uh, and I know that you can speak a lot more intelligently to this than I can, but, you know, it's a, it's a growing platform already to where it's not just people going on making goofy videos, uh, which is what we tend to see on the outside was like, okay, who, who wants to be on there to market whenever it's just goofy videos? but it's not really what it's about, right? It's about how this platform is literally has become the place where people go. And um, so I'm, I'm very, it, it's a very unique place to be. 
And uh, it's, it's what attracted me so much to what you're doing with it. So uh, I appreciate you kind of going into that a little bit. Um, you know, tell us, tell us if you want a little bit more about that TikTok uh, ad a- agency and, and, and things of that nature, or we can kind of diversify into this next strategy, next piece of the, the content. Yeah, well, honestly, being there's there's a bunch of agencies that have TikTok as the as their another thing that they do. From as far as I know, I'm the only one that only does TikTok. Got it. And, okay. Um, I try and be extremely niche in what I do, so people trust me more as an expert because that's exactly how I want to self my, set myself up as. And I got to tell you, like last December, when I when I chose to do this and I was like, OK, let's cut off the last Facebook client. I was like, what even is a TikTok ad agency? What are the services people offer? Right. I, I tried scripting for people. I had consulted on accounts before I had grown accounts to 80,000 followers. I had got millions of views organically for people. And these were just like random people who would DM me and like, Hey, Caleb, do you know how to do this? I'm like, I don't know. Let's try it out. I will give you a hell, like a super good price for doing this just to give me the experience. Right. And that's, you know, what even is a TikTok ad agency right now? It's uh, someone that we we run ads for e-commerce businesses almost exclusively because TikTok ads is such a new type of business. I'm looking into lead generation ads right now because, you know, I've, I've heard through the network that other people are doing the same thing. And, and I now need to explore that. Right. So I'm, we focus on profitable generating ads that are either break even or profitable. So we can get cheap traffic because if you look at the CPMs, I could get, anyone can get about a million views if you do it correctly for under $5,000 and That's make, nuts. you know, That's get absolutely get, nuts. Yeah. And, and with that, get 20,000 followers off of that. But if you, if you have, you have to do it correctly and you have to really strategize that content. So I'm head of content. I have a media buyer who's extremely talented and has worked with Alibaba and, and all of that. And then I have an account manager who helps with the whole planning of the process. So that's what I really focus on is content creation because that's my strong suit. And then we strategize it all together. And then on the other side, we either train corporate businesses or solopreneurs how exactly to create a TikTok content campaign and then um, advertise their product organically. So that's that's mainly what we do. But you know that, uh, you know it's ever changing, right? It's whatever people really want for TikTok. And you know sometimes we help verify people because we have access to that. We have access to the forms that give you the blue check mark and you, you know what the different things you need on that checklist are. So we're kind of we either create ads or we consult on people creating content for their business and creating profitable organic campaigns too. So if I hear you correctly, um, when it comes to TikTok and the business environment, you need somebody's help to help strategize on this, or you'll be spending a lot of time maybe creating nothing. Um, But you can kind of look through the minutia and say, okay, here's the few things that you need to do to get you back on track. And these few little small steps could take you from nothing to millions of views and tens of thousands of followers. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's, ex- that's exactly what happened to me. My first video, I had nothing in terms of a link in my bio and then I have a lead generation tool. I get 300,000 views on a video and I'm not finding a way to monetize them at all. Views don't necessarily turn into dollars. And you don't necessarily need to go viral to make money off of it too. I've had videos that get 2000 views that generate me $10,000, right? But it's the right way of, of making that content to prep them for the sale that you set up and, and the way that you orchestrate it. Um, it's, not, it's not viral hacking, it's not growth hacking. It's just a consistent sales process with a strong content strategy. That's almost like an email lead up to your sales call or your offer that you have. That's really what we help you do in terms of organically 
ads is a whole other beast <laughs> where we, you know, we have to test out content, 10 different pieces, look at their click through rates, make sure that the offer page is really good. And, and if there's a fall off in the funnel, then patch up that hole and, you know, fix the offer. Right. So that's a little bit different, but yeah, organically. Yeah. That's it. And that's, that's why, that's why I interview people or I'm starting a podcast where I, I interview people about going viral as a business owner. And the main thing I've, I've heard in these interviews is I just wasn't ready. Mm. And that's what I help people do is, is be ready for that. That's process. awesome. That's fantastic, man. Uh, if you are wondering what to do with your content strategy, I highly recommend reaching out to Caleb. Um, he seems to have the golden nuggets that you will need to make sure your content and your sales strategy match whenever it comes to the social media platform of TikTok. So, um, so Caleb, we're going to talk a little bit about that thing that's wrapped around your face. Uh, we like to call it a beard. So uh, walk us through Caleb's life and the life of Caleb's beard. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Yes. So in the, the Mormon church has a lot to do with my beard because they outlawed beards for uh, leadership positions in the church. You could be a bishop and have a beard. Anything above a bishop can't have a beard. It just and it goes back to a rule in the 70s where hippies were the ones that had the beards and you didn't look professional. Hmm. Obviously, that's changed. And I have always wanted a beard. I, I will, And at that school that my wife went to in Idaho, mm -hmm. they, they had to have a beard at that school. You have to have a beard card, which is a, as like a doctor's note that says wow. you have shaving problems and you have to have a beard. Like you can't handle shaving daily. Wow, that is and crazy. Yeah, it is absolutely insane, bro. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I always was against that. I was always kind of against the grain, against the rules, and even on my mission, missionaries can't have beards either. And it was, and it was always, it's like, gosh, dang. So I started out with the mustache in high school, little goatee, and then. You know, my brother had a chin strap and I was like, oh, I can't copy off of him because he has a chin strap. And so I always like kept a little goatee and my wife, girlfriend later was like, this, this is so ugly. You have to, <laughs> you have to fill it out. And it was first stringy. And then on my mission, since I had to shave every day, I actually did have shaving problems and I <laughs> never had, never heard of this happening to anyone but i like shaved and it created a little cyst like oh i don't know wow. i don't know what happened but i think i tried popping a pimple it like exploded on the inside made half of my face like stiff and then it became this cyst on my cheek because of Holy a little cow. shaving bump that wow. i like nicked wow. and uh that became infected whatever i it just was it like popped one day, went to the hospital. They had to like do the same thing, the, the ultrasound on my cheek to make sure it wasn't like digging into any bone or muscle. And then turns out they just were like, yeah, just got to drain it. And uh, that's where I was like, I really just need to not shave. I can't handle shaving. And on my mission, I got permission to like shave once a month. And I always had like a nine o'clock shadow or something like that and, <laughs> um yeah so that's where it started and then after i got back i was like I, but right before i i got back from my mission i had already shaved not shaved in like a month and a half because i was like i don't even care about this anymore i'm like <laughs> i'm so ready to have a beard and the main reason i always wanted a beard was because i have a double chin that i wanted to hide so i i have I have, I had it and then I grew it out and it was always just a power struggle for me to, to say like, you don't, this doesn't look unprofessional. This, this isn't anything wrong. This has to do completely with between me and my wife. My wife finds me attractive with the beard. My self-esteem is also attached to my beard and you don't get to control me and how I do that. 
And it also is the same thing in the wedding industry. The wedding industry is clean shaven, mm -hmm. whatever. You're supposed to look pro, wear all black. And I also refused to do that. You know, I, I wanted to wear chinos. I wanted to wear, uh, you know, they always wore dress up shirts. I would always sweat through them on a summer day holding a freaking 15 pound camera yeah. and having to focus on that. So I embroidered my logo on uh, just a polo. And I was mm -hmm. like, this is who I am. You either become my client and accept who I am as a person or we don't work together. Like, I don't care who looks dirty to me at a, at a wedding because I don't look normal to you. This is who I am. So that's always been like the main factor too, is like, don't tell me what to do. I, oh, we can respect each other and <laughs> it, no matter how I look. Right. So that's, that's, it's always been a power, a power struggle with anyone and with culture. And it's, it's, I, I guess, like my protest <laughs> against people. And the, the last thing is I've always kept a beard to conceal my age too, because people usually assume I'm 30 to 35 years old. And I also deal with, I have dealt with people who think I'm an inexperienced business owner because I am 25 and I am probably half the age of most of the people I work with or, or you know, more than that sometimes. And, you know, I, I want to be on the same level. I don't think about age whenever I work with people, but once they hear I'm 25 and, you know, they expect me to be older too with a kid and a wife, I set the playing field level and uh, the beard really helps with that too. So <laughs> no, that's, that's great. That's a great piece of advice there. I mean, especially when you're younger, I was in uh, positions of authority when I was younger as well, managing private country clubs in North Dallas at 19 years old. And uh, luckily uh, I was already receding in my hairline. So um, it was, it was a little easier, still had a little bit of the baby face, but uh, you know, the, the hair was kind of falling out. So people kind of like, oh, it looks like he's a little older. Um, but you know, that's here nor there. No, that's a, that's a great point. And uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm really sorry that anybody ever judged you uh, when it came to the beard. You know, I think that's one of the pieces where we all kind of struggle in that, you know, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable in the professional world. And I, I, I want to applaud you for rising above and just being like, this is who I am. Like, I don't care if I don't look like everybody else. I'm good at what I do. If you don't like it, don't hire me. There's plenty of other, you know, Joe Schmoes out there that'll do what you want them to do. Jump, jump when you say jump, but that's just not who I am. And so, you know, take me a, as I am and I'm going to give you the best experience of your life. And that's really what people care about is that end result about getting the job done. Not so much about the other side of it. Like, Hey, this is what I want it to look like, or here's how, what my expectation is. So, um, you know, even again, you know, I'm going to go back to your youth again, even at 25 years old, like so much wisdom built in there. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with how you feel about yourself, right? A lot of that uh, self-esteem comes from the fact that you are completely secure in who you are. And everything from that point forward is just like, this is who I am. This is how I'm going to run my business. And, you know, I'm going to point it back to your family. Like they're the most important thing to you not somebody else's opinion. And so, again, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of people out there that are going to hear this that are going to be really wowed. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think what I appreciate you even like, this is this is such a, um, I guess, a, a small community of people that I feel deal with this problem. And you're finally talking about the judgment that's happened. It's like generational problems with with facial hair that is somehow yep. in our society and you, <laughs> you're bringing it to light too and it's i think it's important you know we talk about it too and no, no matter how small it is if it's just facial hair and interviewing people is unprofessional for having it right who knows where this conversation is going to go with other people right um i know that these are the things that i've struggled with i've had a beard for one year never had facial hair before then um, outside, maybe, of, you know, not shaving for a weekend or something along those lines. Um, but, you know, it was always frowned upon in my country club industry is like you had to be clean shaven. And all of the people that were there that were professionals. And even if you look at our politicians, like just now you're starting to see some of these executives and politicians coming forth with beards and, you know, the the beard shaming that kind of came behind that even and the and the slack that they got. So. 
Um, you know, I've pulled up to, I've literally pulled up to stoplights and looked over, uh, you know, I'm on my way to church. I got the, you know, the mustache all curled up and I look over to the left and people are just shaking their head at me, you know, and I'm just like, whoa. And I just, you know, I'm the kind of guy, I just like look over and I'm like, hi, how are you? Yeah. Right. And um, so it's, it's kind of funny, you know, kind of funny, but kind of not at the same time. And so, you know, I'm, I, I am glad that we're kind of talking about it and getting out in the open. Yeah. And, and also with quarantine too, my beard, I don't know, it's like three inches long, something like that. And, you know, I, I also think it, I, I saw you did a poll on, you know, how people view beards. And another problem is, you know, the grooming standards, there's not enough education either on just taking care of your beard. Sure. You see those, there's, I, I finally start seeing, you know, I, I remember going to the mall and, and like asking those beard shop reps, like, what, how, what is all this? How can it help my beard? And, you know, they're like, oh, well, you know, here's this comb and here's this different oil for you to help you. And, but, but anyway, during a quarantine, I grew it out because it used to be pretty short. And my wife just kept on saying like, yeah, keep on, keep on going it out. And I did, I guess I didn't realize how long it had gotten until people were like, dang, look at that beard, bro. Wow. That is intense. And I was like, is it? Do I, do I look more intimidating or something? <laughs> because I know if I was working outside and like my hair, my sideburns would like puff out and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that, or my hair wasn't done. I know people like would just like avoid me. If I, sure. if I had my hands dirty, my shirt was dirty and I just done yard work or whatever, I go to Home Depot and people like assume I'm just like this gruff, like yep. <laughs> intense oh, guy. You. Yeah, you're speaking, you're hitting the nail on the head. Like literally, I got to go run a comb through my beard before I run out, right? Um, you know, because it, you're you're exactly right, and mine will too. It'll like puff out. So the water in mine makes my hairs really coarse, and so they'll frizz. So anytime that I put water in there, even if I just get a little water and you know comb through it, it'll make it real straight for a second, and then all of a sudden it starts to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and you look terrifying to people is what I realized. Like I would be at weddings and there would be my second shooter who's, you know, like 18 years old, clean shaven, looks like he's 12. And they, they talked to him about mm -hmm. his camera. Like there was always this problem. Like they would always talk to my second shooter instead of me. And then they would always go, oh yeah, talk to my boss. And they're like, oh yeah, I was just talking to him, whatever. And I was like, what? <laughs> What is the problem here? Why don't you, why didn't you feel like, like I was friendly enough to talk to, but all of a sudden I'm like this scary guy who just, just like, I don't know, maybe I have a, the RBF resting bitch face, you know, with, with like with just a beard, like it makes it more pronounced, I guess. I don't know. But I, I definitely noticed that like, we're selling roofs too. Like mm. that's in the contractor industry. They all have beards and they're all sure. conservative. Right. And I would go to the door and people wouldn't expect me to be a salesman either. They'd expect me to be on the roof fixing mm -hmm. it. And I just, they, I, I could tell they would be gruff. And sometimes I would even like raise my voice, like the pitch of my voice the octave, yeah. to make it more friendly to them to make, to bring down the, super masculine vibe and and have them assume i'm friendlier than i am it's just you just have to overcompensate for mm -hmm. for you know what people assume yep absolutely now you, you're hitting it right on the head man guys uh if you're if you're still following us right now i mean you are getting an insight to the world and uh, we want to hear from you we want to hear your experiences and tell us about the things that you've gone through i mean this is really ripping off the band-aid and kind of exposing some of the things that people don't really know about. And, um, you know, I'm not going to sit back and say, oh, woe is me, because at the end of the day, you know, kind of like Caleb talked about earlier, however people judge me is their own thing. I can't do anything about that, but there is some awareness that needs to be brought to this. And maybe, maybe we're doing it subconsciously and don't even realize what we're doing. And so I'm sure I do it on other things. But um, yeah, this is this is great, great stuff. So, uh, Caleb, appreciate you so much sharing everything so far. 
Uh, definitely wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of talk about um, anything that you have upcoming or, or things or places to find you, um, any type of promotional type things. Yeah, so uh, I'm currently working on a TikTok World Summit where we're going to have a bunch of speakers that are influencers and, and marketers and we're working with TikTok to become a sponsor of the event and also have their head of marketing speak at it. And we're trying to really create a culture of, of doing this every year. And uh, it's going to lead into our TikTok business school event that we will also be uh, hosting a month later, but we will be holding that event at the end of June. Um, and if you follow me anywhere, if you follow me on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, I post every day and repost my TikToks everywhere. And everywhere where there's a link in the bio, there will be an invite to that event. And we're going to just be sending out those tickets or going to be, you can buy those tickets for the price of the swag that we'll be giving away. And you guys are going to love it. And that's the next biggest project that we have right now. And I would really appreciate if you could follow me anywhere. It's at, my, my uh, username is at Caleb M. Rob, Caleb .m Roberts everywhere. So uh, just follow me on there and then I can uh, give you guys those updates for those events. Absolutely. We're going to put uh, links to all of your social media in the show notes, as well as a link to um, the uh, event that you're going to have coming up as well. So we'll have everything in the show notes for everybody and make sure that uh, they can find you everywhere you are. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Well, hey, Caleb, I appreciate you being on here. Um, thank you so much. And uh, you have a wonderful time. We look forward to seeing you socially. Thank you. Thank you so much. See ya. Take care. Lose you, and I don't know where.